Okay, so welcome to this uh, to this seminar. Uh, speaker today is Noemi Stan. She's a PhD student here under the uh, with uh, working on the Marie Curie program uh, Cafe related to uh, to forecasting of of climate at subseasonal scales, and she will give this talk as, as part of the requirements for the PhD for the PhD program. The title of the talk is Tula Canadian Approaches to Atmospheric Blocking. So please, you can, you can start. Okay, um, thank you. And good morning, everyone. Um, so, um, okay, so let me start uh, with the outline of my talk. Um, first, I will be talking about atmospheric blocking. So I will start by defining what um, atmospheric blocks are and uh, why we want to study them and what are the challenging uh, challenges in studying them. Then, since we take a Lagrangian approach to study these events, um, well, this means that we base our study on the trajectories of traces in the atmosphere. So I will explain in more details uh, how we get these trajectories um, and so on. And once we have the trajectories, we interpret them in two different ways using two different tools. Uh, the first tool comes from dynamical system theory um, and it's called finite time Lyapunov of exponents. And the second tool comes from network theory and it's called Lagrangian flow network. And so I will explain both um, and we will see what type of results we get with them and what information we can gain with that uh, about atmospheric blockings. All right, so first a bit of uh, background on blocking events and um, maybe atmospheric science in general. Here on the left, you have um, a picture with the Earth and the wind speed at 250 hectopascal. So that's roughly 10 kilometers up in the atmosphere um, at the boundary between the troposphere um, and the stratosphere. And the, the pink uh, color corresponds to the strongest wind currents, which are called the jets. And normally what happens is that the weather systems, so the um, cyclones associated with low pressures and empty cyclones associated with high pressure, travel along the, uh, the jet from west to east. Um, but um, sometimes this movement gets stuck. And then what we might get is a pressure pattern, which looks um, maybe like this one with low, high, low pressure cells that remain in place for several days to several weeks. Um, and so exactly this, this anomalously stationary pressure pattern, that's uh, what we call a blocking event. Um, okay, no, so this is what is happening in the atmosphere. And the reason that we care is because when this happens, uh, it's usually, or it can have extreme consequences on the weather. So this is a famous example of a blocking event that occurred um, in the summer of 2010. In the center, you have a map. Uh, so just to give you a bit of orientation, you have Spain here, uh, the rest of Europe and uh, Russia over there. And um, what you can see on this map, the, the colors correspond to geopotential height anomaly. So the geopotential height, that's the height of a certain pressure level um, in the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and so you can think of this as the pressure anomaly in the atmosphere. And what we can see is that we had much higher pressure than normal uh, in this region in July, August of 2010, and lower pressure than normal in those regions here. And the consequences was that um, in this region of high pressure, the, um, we, we had a heat wave which led, which led to forest fires and uh, loss of crops and also had consequences on people's health uh, in general. And interestingly, while we had this heat wave here, um, we also had extreme rainfalls in the north of Pakistan and the north of India, which led to uh, floods. And one of the mechanisms behind this is that uh, the stationarity of this pressure pattern allowed for cold air from the north, so from somewhere here to come down towards Pakistan and India, and arrive there just during the monsoon season. And so this combination of cold air and moist air um, is what led to the condensation and the extreme rainfalls. Um, okay, so this is one example. Then 
Another example that I find quite interesting is the one of the steering of the Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So again, here you have a map which shows the pressure field um, in the atmosphere in October 2012. And we see that we had a high pressure cell here and two lows here and there. And the white circles, the white dots, they show the trajectory of the hurricane. And normally what happens is that these hurricanes, they start um, somewhere here, and then they just um, go up there and die somewhere here in the North Atlantic. But in that case, because of this pressure pattern that remained there for several days, um, and especially because of this low pressure here, it kind of steered the hurricane uh, which hit the coast. Okay. Uh, so in the previous two examples, the blocking patterns that I showed uh, were called omega blocks. Um, but in reality, there is a large range of circulation patterns that have been referred to as blocking. And this slide is just to illustrate this. So I don't want to go into the detail of employee picture that we see here, um, but whoop, I don't know what happened. Uh, sorry. Okay. Let's see. Okay, sorry for that. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, anyway. Um, so I just wanted to yeah, illustrate this uh, variety in blocking flavors uh, with this slide. And also to tell that there is a difficulty in defining rigorously what uh, blocking is um, in general. But um, the consensus, the general consensus is that um, a blocking is a pattern in the atmosphere. Um, which appears in the middle to high latitudes. So that's um, the latitude of the jet, more or less. And uh, it must be first quasi-stationary. That means it must last at least five days. Um, and it must have a certain extent in scale, of course. So um, in this case, we're talking about synoptic scales, which is of the order of 1,000 kilometers. Now, um, these events have been studied for many, many years, but still there's a lack uh, of theory. Or we don't have like one complete theory that covers the onsen uh, maintenance in the case of blocking. So we don't know why exactly at some point um, these pressure patterns would stop moving. And also we don't know why uh, they start moving again. And partly due to this, um, there's, um, well, blockings are not very well represented in climate models which means that there's a lot of uncertainty regarding what is going to happen to their frequency and their intensity and the climate change. Um, so with this, I hope that I motivated enough the fact um, that uh, they are important even to study and um, that there are still a lot of things to do and to understand here. Now coming to the second part of my talk, um, so I said that we take a, a Lagrangian point of view and in, in outline I said that this means that we study the trajectories of small traces in the atmosphere. Um, so the trajectories are obtained by integrating this equation where x uh, would represent the position of the tracer and b um, is the velocity field. And the way that we integrate this is via software which is called FlexPart. Um, so what we do is that we feed FlexPart with um, wind tree analysis, uh, so information about the wind, which comes from a blend of observations and model data. So we give this wind information to FlexPart, and then we also give information about other meteorological fields like um, the temperature, the pressure, um, the humidity, and so on. And what the model does is that it improves um, the wind information with smaller fluctuations and then integrates this equation and outputs the trajectories. In practice, um, we are considering as a domain the whole northern hemisphere. That means that our traces are initialized all over the northern hemisphere. And for the integration times, uh, it depends what we're interested in. But in general, we consider times from 12 hours to five days. Um, and yes, I also wanted to say here that um, so this approach is general uh, different from the normal approaches which use alluring fields like the geopotential height 
uh, or the potential vorticity to steady blocking. All right, so once we have the trajectories, we want to extract uh, meaningful information from them uh, about the blocking. And this is done, as I said before, uh, via two different tools, the finite time airplane of experience and the Lagrangian like neural network. So I will now come to this and show you the, the results that we get with both of them. Um, but the big question is um, if these methodologies can identify distinctive atmospheric circulation patterns uh, that are associated with the block. Okay, so the first one is the finite time Lyapunov exponent. And the basic idea is to measure the growth of an infinitesimal perturbation under the dynamic of the flow. So if you imagine two traces that we place really close to each other, um, then we want to see after the integration time, um, so once we have the complete trajectory, how far they have gotten from each other. Mathematically or numerically, this is done by defining a flow map, which associates to every initial position, a finite position uh, at the end of um, the trajectory integration. And then we take the Jacobian of this flow map. So this is done by taking the ratio of the final distances to initial distances simply. Um, and we do this computation to get something which is called the cauchy queen stress tensor. And then from this stress tensor, we take the maximum eigenvalue, so that's the eigenvalue in the direction of maximum stretch. Um, and using this uh, stretching factor sigma, uh, we can compute the finite time Lyapunov of exponent, which we call lambda with this formula. Okay, so when we compute this, we get as output a scalar field. And you can see an example of what this might look like here um, in the Northern Hemisphere. In the background, you have a map. Uh, so just to um, like show you the scales, you have um, the US here and Europe here. And every point is color coded according to the finite time Lyapunov exponent value at this point. So that means that the darker color corresponds to places where the stretching is higher. And from this picture, you can visually identify um, whether the structure, so those dark blue lines that repel trajectories. Um, OK, now, if instead we were not interested in repelling uh, structures, but in attracting ones, what we can do is integrate our trajectories backward in time and do exactly the same computation for the finite time Lyapunov exponent. And then we might get um, something like this, which shows the field of um, attracting structures this time. Um, now, um, of course, both are important and informative, but in the following, just not to get too broad, I will focus on the attracting structures only. Um, now, what is important is that the structures are called Lagrangian Froyum structures, um, and they can be thought of as manifolds that act as transport barriers in the flow, meaning that they separate regions with different dynamical properties and they prevent uh, transport between these regions. So if we have one tracer that starts on one side of the manifold uh, or like of the structure, it probably wouldn't cross on the other side. All right, um, now coming back to our focus, which is on blocking, we will look at what is happening in this region because this region is the region where the blocking occurred in 2010. So the one I talked about um, in the introduction a few slides ago. Um, and just to give you a bit more details on this uh, blocking event, you can see here the geopotential heights at 500 HPA. So again, you can think of this as the pressure patterns in the atmosphere. Um, and you see that the main of this blocking lasted from July 13 to August 10, and was um, in fact, uh, I mean, it consisted of not one blocking event, but two different blocking events uh, that were consecutive. So um, you can see that the pressure patterns were slightly different, but the center of the high pressure cell, which is marked with the star, was more or less in the same place. So we can really consider them just as one blocking. Uh, this is fine. All right. So now here I have a small movie to show you uh, how the finite time gap of uh, exponent fields showing this attracting structure evolved during uh, the blocking period. 
in the northern hemisphere. So let's look at this. Maybe I can put it full screen so you see better. Um, all right. So we see how the field of um, attracting structures is evolving um, every three hours. I mean, there are snapshots every three hours. And we see that the structures are moving quite fast and that there are many structures. Um, and maybe if you pay a lot of attention, you might see that there are stronger attracting structures uh, moving around the blocking region than within the blocking region. Um, but still, this is, I mean, it's hard to follow exactly what is happening and to extract meaningful information from what we see here. Um, so the idea that we had um, in order to uh, detect small persistent structures, um, instead of looking at the three hour snapshots like we did before, we took averages over four days. So in the next movie, what you will see is that every um, picture is in fact an average of the field over four days. Let's see. Um, so you can see how this evolves here. And what we see now is that indeed we have more structure in front of like upstream and downstream of the blocking region, but in the blocking region here, this is quite um, empty from from very attracting structures. Um, so, so yeah, the, the way to understand this is that the structures outside the blocking region were more persistent and were more strongly attracting um, than inside the blocking region. And also, you will see at some point at the end of the blocking um, period that the region feels again, exactly you know, like it feels again with um, structures. So. So this is this lack of structure is indeed due to the, the presence of the block. Okay, okay now finally, um, I said that uh, the structures guide the movement of traces and that traces shouldn't cross uh, these structures. So let's see if um, this is indeed the case. So we, here we have initialized a small set of traces in red, and you will see um, here how they evolve in the finite time map of exploding fields. Um, there, so we see that indeed they they closely follow the the deformation process and they stay kind of constrained between um, structures, um, stronger attracting structures. All right. Um, Okay, so in conclusion uh, from, for this part, we can say that the finite time Yapunov of exponent field highlights uh, dynamical structures that change rapidly in time. But if we look at it in a, in a smart way, let's say we can highlight the blocking region. And um, we also saw that the structures that we see, they are indeed meaningful because they indeed guide the, the movement of particles. Okay, now we can come uh, to our second um, approach, which is the Lagrangian flow network. Um, so the idea here is to interpret the fluid transport as a flow network. Um, so whereas before we were focusing on the transport barriers in the flow, now we want to look at the connectivity patterns that exist inside the flow. Uh, so let's see how we do this. First, um, the, the network construction is very simple. So the idea is to divide the domain into a certain number of boxes. Um, so the domain here, again, it's the Northern Hemisphere that hasn't changed. And um, each box is a network node. So nodes are spatial locations. And then in each box, we initialize a certain number of particles. And we affect these particles um, for a certain time. And then at the end of the integration, we look um, where are transitions? So if um, some particles have gone from box PI to box PJ, then we set up a link between those two boxes, um, and we weight this link with the probability of transition between the boxes. So that means that, for instance, here, there would be a higher um, probability to transition from this central box, which is here, to the top um, 
corner, right corner here, then from this central box to this uh, lower corner here. Um, and the, the weight of the links, we call that PJ. So um, I just want to mention that here because it comes again um, in the next slides. Okay, so once we have the network, we can compute a range of measures. And uh, here I'm just gonna show three of them. Perhaps the simplest one or the, the one we can start with, uh, the most intuitive one is the network out degree. So what we expect here is that because the, the air mass within the blocking region is um, kind of um, isolated from the rest of the atmospheric flow, then we, we suppose that this air mass should have lower degree or the node should have lower degree in that area. Um, so let's see if this is indeed the case. Um, so here we have the results and uh, there are lots of stuff. So let me just um, go step by step. First, these white lines, they show the um, geopotential height control. So again, um, it's um, the shape of the pressure field. And we see that this deformation here, this indicates the presence of the blocking. Um, then again, in the background, you have a map to show you a bit of orientation and um, the, the color field, this is the degree field. And what we see is that indeed in the blocking region, we have lower values of the degree. And we also see that the blocking region is surrounded by higher degree values. Um, so this is all right. But now if we look at a later time during the same blocking event, uh, so the, the pressure patterns have changed a little bit, but the blocking is still there, it's still located here. And we still see that we have lower degree values um, in this region, but it's not as clear as before that um, this would be much lower than the surroundings. I mean, like the, the controls of the blocking are not um, as clear as before. So, all right, um, so this is for the degree. Now we can also look at a different measure, the network entropy, which is computed like so. Um, so this time is a weighted measure. You can see that we take into account the, the weight of our networks. Um, and uh, one way to think about this is that this shows the amount of information that is gained by observing the position of the particle at time t plus tau, knowing that it was initially in box bi. So essentially this should show um, the, the regions where there is a lot of stretching uh, in the flow where the particles go in very different directions. Um, and again, what we expect is that within the blocking region, the, um, uh, the values of entropy should be lower uh, because the air mass is more stationary than outside the blocking region. So let's see. Um, so again, we have um, our block, which is located here. And well, we see that indeed the, the values are a bit lower in that region than in the, in the rest, at least along that latitude. Um, although it's not um, super clear. And then we see that um, at a later time during the same blocking, we, we still have um, lower values here within the blocking region than outside of it. Um, but the picture is quite blurry still. So these two measures that I showed now, they were local measures. And we thought of, um, instead of taking a local measure, see what would happen if we take a path-based measure. This is the next one, uh, and it's the harmonic closeness centrality. Um, and in that case, we define it this way. So uh, we have the d, i, j, uh, which are defined as one over p. So it's one over the probability uh, of transition between two boxes, which means that if there's a lot of flow that's going from box b, i to box b, j, um, then this distance or the, the d, i, j should be small. And if there is not much flow that goes from box bi to box bj, then this t should be very large. So that's how we define this uh, closeness neutrality. And well, um, let's see directly what happens. So in this case, we see that we have very high value of closeness um, following this path here. And in fact, this is the path of the jet stream. So it's the strongest wind current um, that um, I showed you um, or that I talked about uh, in the introduction. And so indeed, um, like what, what the closeness does as a path is that it does highlight the, the boxes that are well connected in terms of flux and 
who's like, yeah, like the box that is well connected to this neighbor in terms of folks and, and then and so on and so on and so on. So it does highlight uh, strong currents. And what is also interesting is that we do see that within the blocking region, we have very low values of uh, centrality, uh, closeness centrality, which um, indicates that this region was kind of isolated from the rest of the flow as, as we expect. Um, okay. So then we can look also at a different time during the blocking. And uh, this is also quite good because this wasn't that well identified by the um, uh, entropy and the degree, but here uh, we we can clearly show the presence of the blocking that is here and the deformation of uh, the jet current around it. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, uh, just a, a third example to show you that if we have a slightly more complicated situation where here we have uh, four different uh, pressure cells, so there's one here, one here, um, or maybe one here and one here, um, then the uh, the closeness centrality does detect them, but the, the picture is slightly more blurry, but I mean, we still have the information, we, we still see it. Okay, um, and now, uh, yeah, to conclude this uh, section, we can say that the degree and the entropy highlight regions where the stretching of the flow is high, and they highlight the controls of uh, the blocking region. Uh, but they are not as good as the closeness, which highlights the main cones, uh, the jet, and its deformation around the broken region. And finally, just a point to say that uh, these two methodologies that I showed um, are not unrelated. In fact, some years ago, there's a PhD student here at IFISC that has done uh, work to relate, or that has shown um, uh, that the entropy and the degree can be related to the finite time we have exponent. Um, so the reference name is here and his name is uh, Enrico Sergiacomi. And in particular, he showed that the average of the finite time we have exponent in each box that we use for the network should be more or less equal to the entropy in that box. Um, so we checked that relation to see um, if this helped. And indeed, we see that we, we do have good agreement uh, between the two. So, uh, so this is nice um, and uh, gives us maybe confidence uh, in our method. And so as a general conclusion, um, I can say that both methodologies clearly trace the spatial temporal um, characteristics of blocking situations. For the finite time Yapunov exponent, uh, we have seen that it highlights um, um, dynamical structures that change rapidly in time, uh, but um, it shows like the structures that are more persistent outside the blocking regions um, than within it. And for the closeness centrality, uh, I mean, for the Lagrangian flow network, we saw that the best measure is the closeness centrality, uh, which highlights the main current, uh, the jet, and its deformation on the block. And um, now what is still um, like an open question is, so, so we have seen that uh, both methodologies are able to identify the block, but we don't know yet if they have potential to predict um, anything about the onset of the blocking period and uh, maybe anything about its decay. Um, and also we have um, relation showing that uh, the degree and the entropy can be related to the finite time the of exponent. But for closeness centrality, we don't yet have something relating it to the actual physic, uh, physics of transport and mixing. So that's also something that would be um, very interesting to, to study um, in future work. And just before um, I completely finish, I just want to acknowledge CAFE, uh, which Emilio mentioned um, at the beginning of my talk, and which is the ITN within which I'm doing my PhD. So CAFE stands for Climate uh, Advanced Forecasting of Subseasonal Extremes. And the aim is to improve the prediction um, of these extremes, so drought and um, blocking events and so on, um, at the subseasonal time scale. So that's from 10 days to three months. Um, and it's a, it's a period that for a long time was considered, or I think like meteorologists, they call that a predictability desert uh, for a long time. And, um, but yeah, like recently it has been understood that using phenomena such as blocking, right, this prediction can be um, improved. So 
so this is what we're doing and if you're interested well um, of course you can ask questions or you can go to, to the website later and uh, i'll just come back to the slide and uh, leave you there so thank you for your attention and that's it okay good so th thank you uh, noemi for this presentation and now it's time for questions or for comments so please you can unmute your microphone and, and ask some questions if you have one Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes, so yeah, thank you. Really nice present presentation, Mimi. And yes, I, I, I was just curious because I didn't get the, the details about your velocity field. Like I didn't get if it is just data or if you have a data plus a model or I, yeah, I didn't got this part. Yeah, so it's, um, uh, it comes from way analysis, which means that, um, so it's based on observation, but then it's not only the observation, it's like enhanced observation. So as far as I know, like uh, they take the observation and then they just feed it into a model and they kind of like make a blend of the model and the data together um, to kind of smooth the observation with data. So it's observational data, but without too much noise and uh, that should be consistent over time and so on. Um, and the way I obtain this is um, just by, so, so it's freely available um, on some websites online uh, from the meteorological agencies. Um, I think in that case, the one I use is from the American National Center for Environmental, I don't know what, uh, NSEP, so yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So, but, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> it is yeah. because of the, yeah, you, you need to, to enhance the, the time scales of your data or something like that? No, I, I, ah, okay, I don't get why. Do you have to, to use both both things? Okay, so let me go back to the slide uh, because there are two different things. Um, okay, so the yeah, first this, thing- this beast, yeah. This, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, so the first thing, the, the thing that I just said, that's uh, how um, you get the wind tree analysis. Um, um, and we, we get it from uh, this here, this agency. But then like the model that we use Mm -hmm. um, to do the integration, this flex part, um, it takes this point re analysis and it enhances with fluctuations as small as time scales. Okay. Because the, the wind re analysis, I think it has a resolution of 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 degree. And just to get more precision, uh, to get a trajectory that's better, yeah, it makes um, sense. Mm -hmm. It adds like smaller um, fluctuations. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. More questions? Could you give uh, just a num some numbers of the, the number of particles you are you are uh, simulating or the number um, of boxes just, just to have some numbers? Yeah, uh, I think for the finite time Japan of exponent, it's of the order of 4 million, I think. And for the um, network, it's... Um, I think it's something like 12 million, um, maybe a bit less. Um, yeah, I think it, it also depends on the size of the network. Now I said that the network was in the north, uh, northern hemisphere, but in many simulations, I also did a bigger network, so uh, <laughs> yeah. And the but number of boxes, that, that is the number of nodes in the network, in the flow network? Um, that, um, I, I will have to check. Uh, I don't know, but I have a resolution of like two degree by two degree. Um, so, so there are a lot of them, but I, I don't know like the, the range of numbers of that. Mm -hmm. Any more question, comment? Well, well just, just a curiosity, just for, from a computational point of view, is it easier to, to implement the, the network uh, thing rather than the Lyapunov exponents or? Mm, not um, well actually not necessarily i mean it depends like you want a really precise picture of the finite time you have enough exponent um mm -hmm. you need you, you do need to um uh, initialize a lot of particles and that's becoming quickly very expensive whereas mm -hmm. the um, the network you can keep things a bit more um i don't know like it's it's based on a it's more statistical so um so it's slightly easier, but there's not a big difference between the two. Okay, okay. 
I mean, mm -hmm. the end, what takes the most time is the particle um, trajectory integration. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to do this in both cases. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Any more question? No. So if not, then we we will close here the, the session. Thank you, Noemi, and thank you all for attending. And okay, so see you see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.